uh, I, I apologize to anybody who's not a native uh, English speaker. Um, I do tend to talk fast. And so uh, feel free to ask or to clarify things when I get finished. Um, first of all, I want to talk a little bit about the types of respiratory protection. And uh, this is me uh, and various different types of higher level respiratory protection. The um, top right is me in a tight fitting positive air purifying respirator. The one below that with the white hood is a loose fitting positive air purifying respirator. You can't see the tube that goes into the back down to a filter, the one above it. Very high levels of respiratory protection, which are recommended uh, by certain uh, places here in the United States for, uh, for on the medical side. Uh, the CDC actually has well over a few hundred of those that they use regularly uh, at the for lab technicians for the work that they do at the CDC in Atlanta. Uh, also in Alaska and some other other locations. Um, the middle one at the bottom is me in a, a full face respirator. And notice I do have a set of uh, special glasses that inset. One of the difficulties with respiratory protection is being able to see. Uh, I can do uh, wear my, my, my eyeglasses with a loose fitting helmet uh, very easily. I can also have a beard with that loose fitting helmet. I cannot with any of these tight fitting respirators. You lose a lot of the efficiency of, of the um, respirator with that. And then on the far left is a, a pretty standard half-face uh, respirator. For the COVID-19, a lot of the work being done is, is dealing with N95 um, filtering face pieces. Uh, I have a selection over here from uh, 3M, Moldex, another 3M, and MSA. Uh, the bottom left is a KN95, which is very similar to the N95. It's a Chinese model. Um, but the straps actually go around the ears as opposed to around the back of the head. This is surgical N95, which actually happens to be my daughter's issued one that I put in here. My daughter's a nurse, um, and she was just issued this last Monday. It's a very small one. You notice a little bit smaller than the other ones because they actually size fit it. These do come in some different sizes, and um, the N100 that's right next to that surgical N95 tends to be pretty big, even though it's technically a medium, but it has a pretty good face seal. But if you're somebody like my brother who um, can't wear that N95 because he actually has a fairly small face, you're also going to have issues with, with the fit associated. So you need to do proper selection on these. For comparison, I just have a half-face respirator on the, on the bottom right side so you can kind of see what that half-face looks like in comparison to the, to the N95s. Um, respirators come in the United States as to N95 and N100s in terms of the filtering face pieces. And from that standpoint, they have different efficiency ratings. Um, those efficiency ratings um, come from certification through NIOSH for proper testing. And out there, we do have some, some fake N95s that are out there. The one on the right in particular is a fake N95. Um, there should be a TC approval value for NIOSH that, that tells you that it actually is a, an official N95 and it's manufactured properly. Some other issues with the N95, you'll see a medical N95 here from a manufacturing facility, um, 800 people using these over in Ohio right now. And the glue that holds on the strap failed and so they retied it, but now they just put a hole in the N95. So the face seal, which is the most important part of an N95 is now compromised. And so it's not gonna work as effectively as what it would if you, um, if you didn't have that hole in there. Uh, there, the next level down would be surgical and homemade masks. So the surgical mask on the bottom left there is a pretty standard surgical mask. The intention of, of surgical masks and these homemade masks is really to protect somebody else from you, the wearer, or the user. They don't have a lot of all aerosols, um, and, and they do come in a wide variety. This is my daughter's, which she was assigned as a nurse. Um, in addition to the, to the good N95 medical mask, which has a splash protection on it. She was also given this for areas where they don't necessarily need to wear a, an N95, but they wanna make sure that they're doing what they can to, to protect other individuals in case they themselves are sick. Those filtering efficiencies in the United States are driven in the industrial region by uh, NIOSH testing, National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health Testing, which comes out of a formal regulation and the respirators are classified as 199 or 95, depending upon efficiency. So 95 is greater than or equal to 
99 is 99 percent and 100 is 99.9 so um, uh, say the, the uk uh, fp uh, ffp1 ffp2 ffp3 which are like 80 94 99.95 percent efficient uh, they load these to 200 milligrams for the r and p ratings which are designated as resistant or proof oil proof ratings they'll do diethyl phthalate uh, of about 0.185 micrometers in size and for the N series, they'll do sodium uh, chloride charged neutralized particles of 0.075. So they're trying to get the most maximum penetrating particle for testing to get the weakest point. Difficult for the respirator by charge neutralizing. So a lot of these filtering face pieces with the charges on them are much more efficient because the electrostatic effect will actually pull the particles on, under Brownian uh, diffusion and capture them much more efficiently. So up in the upper right uh, corner, there's a little graph showing uh, positive negative charge down at the bottom where the penetration is very low. But once you neutralize the charge, you get you know half a percent, uh, almost 2% penetration uh, for that small particle size. And so they're tested at a, at a worst case scenario. So in the field, they actually work a little better than you might actually see in the um in the laboratory that efficiency of capture is based off a variety of different factors both impaction interception uh, and diffusion all those add up to find between say 70 nanometers and 300 nanometers so uh 0.07 to 0.04 uh, uh, micrometers, uh, 0.4 micrometers in size. And that'll depend upon the filter, the diameter of the fibers in there, the speed of the, or the velocity of the air moving through the filtration uh, device itself and how it's set up. That'll vary um, uh, reasonably between various ranges depending upon whether it's like an N95 filtering phase piece or whether it's a, uh, a true HEPA filter or whether it's actually a, a high efficiency particulate air filter in some um, say hospital setting where they're trying to filter the air going into an uh, operating room. For surgical masks, they don't follow the NIOSH requirements. And so for surgical masks here, they follow the FDA requirements, which means it needs to be resistant to penetration of blood or bodily fluids. It may be NIOSH 95. And if it's NIOSH 95, you'll see on this, this blue one here, it actually says N95 on it. But the one on the right is a surgical mask and it's definitely not an N95. It ha doesn't have that efficiency. They do recommend, but you're not required, that you test it to find out what the efficiency is with 0.1 micro, micrometer, 100 nanometer latex spheres. And they also recommend bacterial filtration efficiency, either by an ASTM method, by a Green and Beasley um, uh, old article, or by a military spec, US military spec. The ASTM um, ha group has actually put together recommendations on levels of uh, these masks in terms of level one, level two, which is based on essentially bacterial filtration efficiency, uh, pressure drop, and then submicron uh, efficiency. And those vary. Um, the bottom for resistance in synthetic blood, uh, they do have to meet that to begin with, but the upper ones are actually all recommendations. They're not required. Now, if they meet them, obviously the manufacturer wants to go ahead and push that as a marketing aspect of it. Uh, obviously, the cost is much higher for a true N95 versus just a typical surgical mask. In terms of efficiency, I took the data that I had from an article that I had put together and, and, and put it all into one particular slide here. And you can see that the N95 filtering face piece has very high efficiency. The surgical mask is all over the place depending upon what the rating is on it. But some other things that people might take use of would be a cloth mask, a handkerchief, a scarf, a shirt, a towel. Each of these have ranges typically from 10 to 60%. The biggest factor actually isn't the filtering material itself. Those tend to actually be very good in terms of the filtering capacity of the material. It's the leakage around the, the, the cloth itself. So if you were to take um, yeah, a good cloth material and test just the cloth, you'd probably get 50 to 80 upwards of 90% of efficiency. Once you put it on a person and get gaps in them, you're gonna find that, the, that that efficiency may drop to 15 to 25%. So it all has to deal with really the, the, the face piece seal in terms of whether it's efficient or not. Um, there was some testing on SARS-CoV-2, uh, uh, COV-19, uh, COVID with a surgical mass 28% with three cotton layers, 80% that just recently came out that's not in this chart. Um, but one of the other things is that the, all these masks, even the cheap cloth mask and the scarf, 
do drop uh, reduce droplet emission, which is very important for one aspect of potential transfer. So when somebody sneezes or coughs, they pre implementation of several articles uh, covering a, a range of, of particle sizes that get produced. Those, um, some of those will setter, settle, the bigger ones will settle uh, pretty close to where the person is who has the symptoms and is uh, expressing those in one form or fashion, typically a sneeze or a cough, as opposed to just general breathing, although you do, you're, you're two, three orders of magnitude lower viral load if you're just breathing versus sneezing or coughing. But a lot of those will settle close, and then some of those will actually be transported uh, and, and diluted. Um, in the United States, I came up with a, a scheme for selecting respiratory protection in the third column here, depending upon whether you're somebody like working in a hospital with, with patients, that'd be class one. If you're typically in somewhat more of a adjacent to the hospital area, uh, you're being class two, and then most businesses are gonna be in class three and four. So this is protection for the person who, who may be in contact with somebody. There may be some optional reasons to go to higher levels if you're in a, if you're in a hospital or if you're in a room adjacent. Um, and then if you uh, want to be concerned about you being potentially symptomatic and expressing viral load by aerosols to somebody else, you may want to wear either an N95 or any type of mouth covering to limit the transfer from you to somebody else. Um, when you do wear one of these, typically an N95 filtering face piece, you should do a, a user seal check. One of the difficulties here, as you'll notice, I have no gloves on my hand. So what if I'd already been using this? I turned around and put my hands on it and had stuff on my hands or vice versa. I had stuff on the, on the, on the filtering face piece and I got it onto my hands. So contamination from the hands to the face piece or from the face piece actually to the hands is something you do have to worry about and, and have to fit into with, with proper hygiene and proper glove usage. This is very comparison to a typical uh, elastomeric respirator where you do a positive fit check and a negative fish check and you're covering the face piece and try and blow out just a little bit to see whether you leak. Typically the leak will be up around the nose and I have a couple other photos I didn't put in here where I have one that's leaking for sure and my eyeglasses fog almost immediately because all, this, all the moist air that comes out of my, my breath goes right up into the, into the fogging area. I will point out that there is a small little probe right next to my pinky and that's not supposed to be on the filtering face piece. That's actually how you test the efficiency uh, actually fit onto somebody. And, and we are supposed to do fit testing for these respirators. You may use something like I have on the left here, uh, isoamyl acetate, which is banana oil, or the two little capsules uh, and, uh, on the yellow black bag there, which are Bitrex, which are bitter tasting aerosol that you put into the, into the air around the person while they're wearing the mask to determine whether or not they can actually taste it or smell it. It's a qualitative. You pass if you don't detect the agent. You fail if you detect the agent. You can get quantitative data like you have on the right here. This happens to be my port account and me hooked up to um, uh, this. I think this is a, um, this is actually a KN95. Um, uh, and I've got a probe testing the inside of the mask and a, and a blue probe testing the outside of the mask. And you can get what's called a fit factor, the concentration outside the mask or the concentration inside the mask. And you did a minimum to pass um, for proper fitting and that would be 100 for a filtering face piece or a half face, and it'd be 500 for a full face. And those convert into efficiency ratings, which we, I can talk about with somebody afterwards if we wanna talk about it. But that's the standard industry for quantitative fit testing. This device here is, is you know, 1,000 plus dollars. You're not gonna have it sitting around at most places, dollars for getting kits to be able to do qualitative fit testing. Uh, the qualitative fit testing and the process for the quantitative are very similar in terms of moving your head up and down, talking, doing things that might break the seal of, of the filtering face piece or a respirator just to make sure that it's actually staying uh, on the person while they're actually using it. As a reminder, personal protective equipment should be the last process that we use. It, it should follow from substitution engineering controls. A lot of people say work practices versus the admin, these three and four could be flipped around. But PPE should be the last usage if we can get it. Uh, we're not always available with resources, limited money and the like, and so it becomes technically primary in many places. We also shouldn't forget that you need to do proper operations and maintenance, no matter how, how you select each of these. Uh, cost is obviously higher for some of the non-PPE usage, uh, but the potential for failure tends to be higher with uh, the bottom as it does to the top. Um, 
so a couple other options in terms of both modifying things that you have as well as managing engineering controls could be using area. Um, you can go from a, a MERV 8 to a MERV 12 to a MERV 16. MERV 12 works very well at reducing particle counts in the area. And so you could actually put those into your normal HVAC system or local blowers or, or units that, that pull a vacuum, small um, portable units. Those can reduce the, the number of uh, particles in the air, which can be very helpful. Um, this is uh, Dr. Chen Yu Chang. I'm going to show you a couple quick little videos here. Uh, Chen is my partner at uh, PhD Environmental Research in Corpus Christi. He did his bachelor's in Taiwan and did his master's and his PhD over here in three-dimensional aerosol science work. And he, he took a MERV-12 filter and built it into a homemade um, uh, small little face shield helmet with the air coming down in front. And he basically took the tubing and hooked it up to a portable little battery-powered uh, device so you could pull air in, turn the uh, turn the pump on, and then you actually have the air supplying down the front. And there's a filter in here, so it'll filter the air and then push it down the front of the face piece. And he did it, and you can see him here on the right hand side holding the pump. And then he's got the uh, the air which comes down the front of the face piece. This is basically a modified PAPR hood style which works really well. As long as you've got a nice MERV-12 filter in there, you're doing a pretty good job of filtering the air and you're pushing it past the face. You're also getting splash protection from droplets. So if you're in a, in a resource limited area and you wanna provide something like this for a medical facility, this is, this is doable in, in, in a number of places. Um, other options, particularly in, in low income areas, would be outdoor airflow. This is a nice little article um, that was put out in 2013, looking at TB spread, depending upon how many air changes you've got by opening up windows and doors and getting good airflow through. So this is very beneficial for not only the air change per hour, but you could see the risk reduction by changing the flow by just opening up windows into small places that normally don't have a lot of airflow and getting that airflow through there. So there's, there's other options that you can do. If you're in a more modern building, the air changes per hour is a big deal. In the United States, um, most buildings are three to 11 air changes per hour. Hospitals tend to be at least six to 15, maybe 16 air changes per hour. And, your, and our houses here range about 0.3 to 0.4 air changes per hour. That's a pretty typical value, and that would be the red here. So inside of our houses, it's a very low airflow rate, but in most of our commercial buildings, it's actually pretty high. And, and in hospitals, it drops out in, say, 30 minutes. So the, the particle count drops very rapidly depending upon the air changes per hour by dilution. So that's another method of actually trying to reduce things so you don't actually have to wear respiratory protection as high as a level, or at least supplement it. Got some references here for you to use, and I have my contact info. You're, feel free to call me or email me. I'll be happy to help you in any way.